you must take your minds back 65 years to the end of the Second World War and within a few years the beginning of the Cold War. At that time, Europe lay in ruins, shattered both physically and psychologically. And at that critical point, America did something <clears throat> never before done in the history of the world. They created what we called the Marshall Plan. This was a plan to help nations recover and rebuild from the war. And we offered it not only to our allies, but to our conquered former enemies. Uh, it had an amazing success, and it's one of the great stories in history, I think. But Joseph Stalin turned down the Marshall Plan and persisted in the relentless program of expansionism to take advantage of the weakened condition of most of the countries of Eastern Europe. Before Stalin was stopped, the Soviet Union had annexed or dominated 600,000 square miles and more than 100 million, 100 million people in Eastern Europe. This problem was articulated brilliantly by George Kennan in his famous X paper, which is called The Sources of Soviet Conduct. It's called the X paper because it was originally published anonymously in Foreign Affairs. Only later was it learned that the author was George Kennan. In that paper, he assessed that communism was dedicated to the destruction of capitalism. There could be, he said, no coexistence. Therefore, he, ar he argued that the wartime cooperation with the Soviet Union was re would, be, would be replaced with a struggle for the heart of Europe, and that we would be in for a protracted period of confrontation with the Soviet Union. The president at the time was President Truman. He accepted Kennan's judgment and went on to formulate policies and institutions for getting us through this long protracted period of confrontation, which came to be called the Cold War. And his policies, containment of the Soviet Union's demonstrated expansion of ambition, while at the same time deterring a nuclear war. Containment and deterring. Very, very difficult to balance those two issues. That was the challenge all through the Cold War. He recognized that those missions were formidable and, most importantly, they were likely to be with us for many decades. So he established new security institutions in order to carry out these daunting missions most effectively. We completely restructured our government and indeed world institutions at the end of World War II. At the national level, he created the Department of Defense. I was once the Secretary of Defense. There was not a Department of Defense. That was only created by President Truman. He created the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He created the U.S. Air Force. All during World War II, we did not have a U.S. Air Force. We had an Army Air Corps and a Navy Air Corps, but no U.S. Air Force. That was created by President Truman. And he created the CIA. All of those were done by Truman shortly as he saw, as he saw the basic institutions he needed to conduct the Cold War. At an international level, he created NATO. And implicit in creating these new institutions, he followed George Kennan's advice that we needed to have patience. This, this is something that Americans are not noted for, but he said we must be patient. This Cold War strategy was severely tested by the Soviet Union on at least five different occasions. And the rest of my introductory lecture, I'm just going to give you quickly go through the newsreels we were seeing as those five different occasions unfolded. The first was the Berlin blockade. To understand the Berlin blockade, you need to understand that after World War II, Germany was divided into two parts, an eastern and a western part. Russia, the Soviet Union, occupied the eastern Germany and the Allies occupied western Germany, but Berlin, the capital of Germany, was in eastern, entirely contained within eastern Germany. We had, and our allies had, soldiers in Berlin as well. And we had to, to get to those soldiers to supply them. We had to go through East Germany. And Stalin decided that he was going to get us out of Berlin. And the way he was going to do this was by blockading it, not allowing our troops to cross, our supplies to cross East Germany into Berlin. And that became known as 
the Berlin blockade. That was the first struggle. The next one was the Korean War, then the Berlin Wall, and then the nuclear arms race. As it turned out, each of these policy and institutions were successful in meeting those challenges. Containment worked, deterrence worked, and successive American presidents of both parties stuck by the policies, the strategy that was formulated by Truman. But in the early years of the Cold War, that successful outcome was very, very far from being certain. So I'm going to take a look now at each of these challenges. First of all, the Berlin blockade. Here is the map of a divided Germany. And Truman, instead of backing out of Berlin, as Stalin had thought he would do, decided to supply the soldiers and the citizens of West Berlin with an airlift. And this is how it worked. The Americans flew into Tempelhof from the south. The British flew in and out of Gatow from the north and also shared the central exit corridor with the Americans. After a few long, agonizing months, the Berlin airlift finally worked and Stalin backed down. And here's a very interesting news reel that was, came out at that time. New supplies going in. It was the help to get through the hard time here in Berlin. Without the airlift, I don't know how the life were going on. <clears throat> we felt extremely sorry for the inhabitants of Berlin, and I felt that uh, my efforts must be worthwhile in trying to alleviate the problems they were suffering. Those were really good, bad times. Working together for a common purpose. We were very ordinary people living in extraordinary times. It took two and a half million Berliners and several hundred thousand British and Americans of all kinds of training and background to keep that airlift airborne. You can sometimes win a battle by restraint. We saved a city without firing a shot. The next test was even more brutal. Stalin authorized Kim Il-sung to invade South Korea. On June 26, 1950, which incidentally was two weeks after I got my master's degree from Stanford and started my first job, two weeks after that, North Korea had powered across the 38th parallel and entered Seoul. Stalin did this on the belief that the Americans would not respond, but he was wrong. President Truman decided to stop the North Koreans by rushing an American reinforcement from bases in Japan and from the US. But Truman was wrong, too. He thought sending over the American troops from Japan was going to stop them, but they were quite ineffective at doing that. And the Americans were pushed all the way back to a very small salient around Pusan, a fishing village in the southern part of Korea. And it looked like we were going to be pushed right off the peninsula. But of course, reinforcements did arrive in time. The North Korea, and the North Korean army was badly beaten after MacArthur made his brilliant landing at Incheon and surrounded them and ended that immediate danger. Indeed, Korea might have gone away as a problem, except the Chinese army intervened in very large numbers. And the world dragged on then for years after that, a bloody, brutal, and costly in American lives. Let me remind you of just how difficult those days looked to us at the time by showing you a newsreel from that era. This was a war of sharp contrasts, like the harsh Korean terrain itself, ranging from freezing mountains in winter to parched valleys in summer. It started in rapid advances and retreats, and it ended in trench warfare and continuous bombardment, reminiscent of the First World War.
The UN forces relied on superior weaponry to limit their losses, pounding the lightly armed communist soldiers who sacrificed thousands, attacking in human ways. That war lost, the uh, Americans lost 50,000 troops. And uh, just a few years ago, we built a very moving memorial in Washington, the Korean War Memorial. If you're ever in Washington, you should stop by to see that memorial. But the war was becoming so long and so bloody that there was much talk of using nuclear weapons to stop it. Indeed, the commander of the American forces, General MacArthur, recommended doing so. And in that supercharged atmosphere, our British ally became quite concerned. And Prime Minister Attlee made an emergency visit to Washington. Britain's Prime Minister Attlee flew to America on behalf of the Allies, seeking assurances against the use of nuclear bombs. And the talk of weapons of mass destruction was toned down. Truman chose another path. On December the 17th, he signed an emergency proclamation putting the economy on a war footing. The massive rearmament drive he launched would continue long after Korea and have a far-reaching impact on American foreign policy from then on. So Truman did not use nuclear weapons, but he did accelerate a major bombing campaign that devastated North Korea. Uh, my first visit to Pyongyang, I was being driven through, that's the capital of North Korea, I was being driven through the town. It's, a, it's really quite a beautiful city, all new buildings. I commented to my host about how lovely and new the buildings were. He said, of course they're new. You destroyed every building in Pyongyang during the Korean War, which was absolutely true. But in spite of the devastation, it did not end the war. It ended in a stalemate. It lasted the rest of Truman's term in office. It was a big issue in the presidential campaign when President Eisenhower said he would bring an end to the war. Indeed, shortly after he became president, he did negotiate an armistice with North Korea and China. So for the last more than 60 years, the Korean Peninsula has lived not in a state of peace, but in a dangerous armed truce with large armies massed on either side of the demilitarized zone, the line where the troops were at the time of the armistice. Well, we will talk in a later lecture about the present danger of North Korea's now that they have <laughs> nuclear weapons themselves. The next challenge laid down by Stalin was the building of the Berlin Wall. Many Berliners responded by trying to escape before the wall was finished. And here again, is what we were seeing in the news reels at the time. There are still some gaps left in the wall, and a few courageous people risked their lives escaping through the makeshift barriers, even East German border guards. Eighteen-year-old Peter Fechter is shot trying to escape and left to bleed to death at the foot of the wall. These were the images we were seeing, the pictures we were seeing in, from Berlin at that time. In many ways, the most dangerous challenge was Khrushchev's decision to secretly deploy nuclear armed missiles to Cuba. I talked about that in some detail in the first lecture, and I showed you some videos from that. I'm only today just going to show you one, what I think is iconic video from that era, just to remind you. In a televised address on October 22nd, President Kennedy warned that the missile bases would provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere and outlined his plan for a naval blockade. To halt this offensive buildup, a strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba is being initiated. Kennedy warned that all ships bound for Cuba would be stopped and searched. Those found to have offensive weapons as part of their cargo would be turned back. It was about 24 hours after he made that announcement before the Soviet ships did stop and turn back. And during that 24 hours, they kept steaming forward towards a confrontation. And every one of those hours, we all thought we were heading directly for a nuclear war. Well, the Cuban Missile Crisis did end without a war, but there were unintended consequences of the Cuban Missile Crisis. 
which were very important. Castro, indeed, tightened his grip on Cuba. Khrushchev was forced out of leadership, replaced by Brezhnev, who intensified the nuclear arms race. And so there began an intense competition between the United States and the Soviet Union in nuclear weapons. This doesn't stem only from the Cuban Missile Crisis, but it's quite clear that the Cuban Missile Crisis intensified that considerably. Both the United States and Soviet had ICBM programs, which in effect began with the V2 program in Germany, which I talked about during our World War II discussion. The V2 base at Pinamunda in Germany was in that part of Eastern Germany occupied by the Soviet Union. So the equipment and many of the rocket scientists were taken to Russia to help the Soviets build their own ballistic missile program. But some of the German scientists, including their leader, Werner von Braun, escaped to the West to avoid being captured by the Russians and surrendered to the Americans. And he became not only a part of the American rocket program, he became the leader for many years of the American rocket program. By 1956, Russia had developed and deployed medium-range ballistic missiles. Indeed, those are the missiles that they deployed in 1962 in Cuba, which led up to the Cuban Missile Crisis. But the Soviets knew that the ultimate weapon was an ICBM, an intercontinental ballistic missile, and they gave that their highest priority. In August of 1957, they test-fired the world's first ICBM. Here is a picture of it in the, the uh, test facility at Tiratam just before it was launched. It's a huge rocket. We're looking at the bottom of it. You see it's not just a rocket. It's multiple rockets ganged together. This is what we called the SS-6. The test was done in secrecy and largely passed the world's attention. But just two months later, they stunned the whole world by launching the world's first satellite. The satellite, by the way, was launched from this very missile. They took the missile, instead of putting a warhead on the top of it, they put a satellite. This was Sputnik, which caused a huge sensation in the United States. October 4, 1957. The Soviet Union made news around the world with its successful launch of Sputnik, the world's first satellite. Only a month later, they did it again with the launch of Sputnik 2. And the Space Age and the U.S. was behind. At Cape Canaveral, Florida, a Vanguard rocket is ready to launch America's first Sputnik into space. But rockets are unpredictable things. Here's and our slow motion here's camera America's attempt to catch up. detected fault in the first stage of the rocket turned the launching into calamity. Not fatal, but disappointing. I think disappointing is an understatement. At first, the American public are dismayed at the accident. But they soon realize that the setback is only temporary. And after all, who knows how many failures the Russians had before their Sputniks were launched. Actually, they didn't have any. <laughs> On February 1st, 1958, the United States successfully launched Explorer 1, America's first satellite to orbit the Earth. The space race was on. Sparked by the groundbreaking Soviet launch of Sputnik on October 4th, 1957. 